Well, hi everyone. I thought I'd give another update on the failure of the Rapidan Dam in Minnesota. I've been out there a few other times. It's astonishing how much additional erosion and cutting has occurred. Essentially, the river went over the left abutment and eroded out a huge area, took out the rock, and essentially is rechannelizing that part of the river. So I want to go over uh, the status of that situation, as well as that of the bridge immediately upstream of the dam. Also, I'm going to talk about what bridge scour is. I'll give you some examples. I'll go over types of bridge foundations that are either most susceptible or least susceptible to this type of phenomenon. So this is what this area looked like on June 29th. It was uh, about five days after the initial overtopping and essentially the river rechannelized itself just to the left of what had been the left abutment of the dam. This is what it looked like on the 4th of July. And here's a drone shot from July 12th. So you can see the large area that's opened up on the left side. So left as you face downstream is left and right orientation. And you can see the scour of the soil, which is causing erosion of that bank, is now progressing towards Pier 1 of the bridge, which is on the west side. This bridge was built 40 years ago, and uh, it's been closed since this episode with Rapidad Dam, which is prudent. I talked to the public works director for Blue Earth County, Ryan Tilgus, and I'm going to tell you what he told me about the condition of this bridge here in a moment. Now, as a reminder, this dam and bridge is located 10 miles southwest of Mankato, Minnesota. And you had the uh, governor coming out and immediately attribute this situation to global warming. I'm going to put that to the side for now and just talk about the engineering aspects. So you can see in the upper right-hand corner is where the dam's located. And it has a couple of pretty pronounced meanders as it flows from south to the north, more or less. It got me thinking that with that additional head cutting, is it possible that this oxbow here gets cut off and the river just rechannelizes to a more direct flow in this area? Of course, it would erode a tremendous amount of material in the process. And that got me thinking to the Steamboat Arabia in Kansas City. It was discovered in 1988, over 150 years after it sank in the Missouri River. And the people who found it found it in a farmer's field that was over a half mile away from the location of the Missouri River Channel at that time in 1988. So rivers are, are really dynamic. They change position all the time. And then when you have people doing things like putting dams or rechannelizing it, it can have unanticipated consequences for changes in the, in the gradient and path of a river. So let's go back to look at this. I just used Google Earth here and drew a line. It's about a thousand feet from the edge of one oxbow if it cuts straight across. And the reason I'm saying that is this area on the northwest side here of the, of the bridge is continuing to erode out and the channel's just getting wider and wider. Hopefully that uh, will get addressed here with some type of rechannelization and energy dissipation. But uh, let's just zoom in here and see what's in the area between. You see, there's a number of houses there. So that would be a disaster if uh, that channel continued to grow unchecked. Now, there's a Federal Highways document uh, evaluating scour at bridges. I'll put a link to this document in the description. But let's look at this uh, Wikipedia entry. Bridge scour is the removal of sediments such as sand and gravel from around bridge abutments or piers. Hydrodynamic scour caused by fast flowing water can carve out scour holes, compromising the integrity of a structure. So as I mentioned in previous videos, soil has an inherent strength called a shear strength. And when the forces of flowing water imparted to the soil exceeds the shear strength, those soil particles are gonna shear off and, and move downstream. And turbulent flow really exaggerates this effect. It really magnifies the amount of scour that would occur. So if you can think about laminar flow where everything's moving in nice parallel directions versus turbulent flow where you have eddies and swirls and currents going in various directions, 
you have the bridge structure, in this case uh, up here, itself causes the turbulent flow. So most of the scour occurs on the downstream side of that quote unquote obstruction. And the effects can be magnified by debris accumulating on the upstream face of a pier or column on a bridge. Now let's just talk about general types of bridge foundations. You have just a footing, could be on directly on bedrock. You have a drilled shaft foundation and you have driven pile and the pile are connected by a cap. So obviously the footing is gonna be most susceptible to scour, but in this scenario, it's farthest away from, from the channel. So it may be safe. The drill shaft, if it's deep enough, would provide the most protection against scour. Piles as well can provide adequate scour protection if they're deep enough, have enough embedment post scour event. Now as a refresher, this is what a drill shaft is. You excavate a cylindrical void in the ground, clean it out, place a reinforcing cage in, and place concrete from the bottom up. Here's a video where we're testing the drill shaft placement. This is for a bridge foundation. As opposed to driven pile, I'll show you a quick video of that. So as I mentioned, I talked to Ryan Tilgus. He said that these bridge piers are supported by driven pile, H pile. That describes the shape. You might have a uh, column in your basement that looks like an H. It's a steel column and that's an H pile in essence, although the geometry is slightly different for these driven applications. And the pier in the middle of the bridge, pier two, probably has the most scour at this point. And they, what happened was that this bridge was installed, you know, 60 or more years after the dam was in place. And there was a lot of sediment upstream of the dam that had accumulated. And so bridge foundations have to transfer loads axially, mostly in compression, as well as laterally. So to resist lateral forces, you have to have embedment in soil or rock or both, depending on the location. And in this case, Pier 2 in the middle of the bridge, uh, Mr. Tilgus indicated that he thought that they initially had about 40 feet of penetration and they were in bearing on top of the sandstone bedrock. And they didn't pre-bore holes to insert the pile well into bedrock because uh, apparently they weren't anticipating the loss of the dam, which would cause very high velocities and scour that would threaten the bridge. This is a view of the dam under normal conditions prior to the failure. Now in 2021, there was a study done, and I'll show a link here in the description to these documents, looking at whether the dam could be repaired or removed along with the associated tasks and the cost for those tasks. But bottom line, nothing was done. This just shows you a timeline. The dam construction was completed in 1911. They upgraded the downstream spillway apron to provide better erosion protection. In 1965, there was a massive flood and the dam wasn't operable for 19 years. And I say operable in terms of generating hydroelectric power. And that power was restored in 1984. More emergency repairs were made in 2002 and 2003 and 2010 and 2017. I think we see a pattern here. In 2019, there was damage to the gates. In fact, two of those gates for the dam weren't in operation at the time of this flood event. And then there's a downstream ice accumulation that did damage to the powerhouse. And so that dam hasn't generated hydroelectric power since 2020. So let's look at what their estimate was. And this is a bar engineering study for repair of the dam. So repairs to the downstream apron stilling basin, tainter gate repair, those are the gates that open and close to allow water to flow through the, the spillway. Upstream stop log slot repairs, intake area gate systems, tail race area, and mechanical electrical equipment upgrades with a 25% contingency put their estimate at $15 million to repair the dam. Optional costs, which they thought was necessary. So in rough numbers, you're looking at a $20 million repair estimate. So they also looked at the costs associated with dam removal. 
and they came in at over $82 million, so four times the cost of repairing the dam. So they had $10 million for removal of the dam, nearly $9 million for the replacement of County Road Bridge 9, immediately upstream of the dam, $14 million for sediment management, $20 million in stabilization materials, riprap and so on, vegetation management, mobilization and water control. So that's a, that's a big number. Now, one of the things that had to be factored in to whether to remove or repair the dam or even replace it was that they really weren't making much money. In fact, it was a, it was a money loser relative to hydropower. So they looked at the costs associated with repairing the dam and over a 40 year period of operation relative to hydropower generation, they would lose over $4 million. And they know this because it was already a money loser. In the 23 year period from 1999 to 2022, the county lost over a half a million dollars in operation for the dam. Now, one of the big issues with removing the dam is what to do with all the sediment that is filled with all kinds of nasty contaminants, a bunch of uh, anaerobic reactions going on in that sediment for decades, if not nearly a hundred years. Here's a map showing the thickness of the sediment throughout the river area. And you can see in places near the dam, thickness is greater than 45 feet. Now here's a definition I wanna to touch on here. And that is, what is the difference between a hydraulic engineer and a hydrology engineer? Hydraulic engineering will focus on the actual design of water distribution systems and drainage systems, considering both pressure and gravity flow. Hydrology will look at surface water and groundwater response to rainfall slash snowfall events and focus on things such as flood forecasting and flood response. So in hydrology, you have things like probable maximum precipitation and then the probable maximum flood. And so those, the values of the probable maximum precipitation comes from meteorological data over a period of decades and you take the size of the drainage basin and you figure out how much rainfall can enter that drainage basin over a given period of time. You figure out how much water would likely soak into the ground versus run off. And of course, urbanization has greatly increased the amount of runoff versus infiltration over the decades as most areas have developed around uh, various dam projects, whatever the purpose of the dam was, whether it was hydropower generation, flood control, recreation, or water supply. Now there's a computer program called HECRAS. I think it's what I hear people refer to. It's been a long time, but H-E-C-R-A-S. And this is a program used to model flow in a river. Now here's a cross section from that bar engineering study looking at whether to remove or replace the dam. And you could see how much sediment was in the channel prior to this recent flood event. They were gonna take a lot of that sediment out. And of course, that was still gonna leave a lot of material compared to the original channel configuration. And I just thought I'd show you this hydrograph to show how high the, the water was in this recent event. So obviously the early summer is the big flow period in a given point of the year. So there are over 90,000 dams throughout the United States. Most of them are well over 60 years in age. Most dams are designed for an expected lifespan of around 100 years. There's a lot of dams that are really in poor condition. Just about a week after Rapid Ed Dam failed, there was a failure at uh, Manawal Lake in Wisconsin, and it was a carbon copy of what happened at Rapid Ed Dam, with the exception that the failure occurred through scour and erosion on the right abutment versus the left abutment at Rapid Ed Dam. And this failure caused a lot of flooding downstream. So I mentioned the governor talking about global warming. I mean, if you look at the historical record, there's been events that produced more flow in the Blue Earth River than this recent event. But because of the poor condition of the dam, their inability to clear the debris blocking the spillway gates within a short period of time, all led to the failure of this dam. And it, it's a failure. Anytime a dam suddenly releases its reservoir water in an uncontrolled fashion, 
it's a failure. And that's what happened here. So I think there's an opportunity taking the, glo the global warming aspect out of the equation. So just consider the fact that most of these dams were built with a limited amount of meteorological data at the time. And since that time, there's been 60 plus years of additional data. So I think there are a lot of places where the precipitation models need to be revamped. The runoff models need to be revamped. And I think what people will find is that many, many dams will require significant upgrades. Now there's a big movement here lately to quote, restore rivers to their natural condition, which there's, that's natural condition is a rather subjective thing. But uh, if you're talking about taking dams out so salmon can spawn easier and things like that, that's one thing. But most of these dams, or I say a lot of really important dams have a flood control function. And people downstream of these flood control structures have become dependent and even with levees, there's, I used to live in Sacramento and uh, the Corps of Engineers would build these levees or upgrade these old agricultural levees. Most of these levees were built over 100 years ago without uh, the aid of mechanized equipment, you know, horse-drawn equipment. And the Corps over the years have, have done major upgrades to these levees. And then what happens? More people uh, develop or live on the land side, uh, not, not the river side, but, but on the land side. And, it just makes the consequences even greater if there's a failure or a breach of a levee or in other cases of a dam. So this is just another component of our aging infrastructure in this country. I don't know where the money's gonna come from. Uh, you know, Minnesota, Blue Earth County, I bet you wish they had done something with this dam and, and they've got a huge mess on their hands. The, the new channel is on the left abutment side of the existing dam is about as wide as the original width of the dam. I mean, it's a huge area and those vertical banks are unstable. So material continues to slough off into the river channel. Material continues to be eroded uh, by flowing water. It's a huge mess, well beyond the costs associated with what would have been done had they made a decision on repair or replacement a few years ago. So I'll do future updates on this uh, overall theme of dam infrastructure in particular. I wanna send a shout out to the channel members. I really appreciate your ongoing support. And certainly I'd like to send a shout out to those of you who have provided super thanks. That's another great way to support the channel. I've got a couple of uh, free digital downloads that I'll put a link to in the description. So you'll wanna check those out and please stay tuned for future videos.